Hello, IoT Village, first and foremost. What it be, what it do. I'm Mark, and boy, have I got some zero days for you. Now, the reason why I call this talk Assembling Voluntron isn't just because I'm hacking a robot and it's a cool name and incredibly clever too, but also because there's four unique CVEs in this target, and when they work together, they kind of create something that's greater than the sum of its parts, just like a mech you might have heard of. So the next thing you might be wondering is, who are you and why should we care what we have to say? Well, to start off, like I said, I'm Mark, to which there's really only one natural response. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at Robsicle. And I'm a, currently a security researcher from McAfee's Advanced Threat Research Team, which I'll be referring to as ATR from now on because it's kind of a mouthful. Now, my focus has been on finding zero-day vulnerabilities, particularly in embedded systems. So this, is really, this talk is really on brand for me, so to speak. Now, uh, as for previous experience, I, sp I spoke at the last year's DEF CON and ICS Village, so I'm basically a celebrity. Now, for hobbies, I really only do two things. I hack and I squat. Now, depending on how nice you guys are to me in the Discord channel after, I might add streaming to that list, but for now, it's just those two. Okay, so let's move on to the target. Temi or Timi or however you want to pronounce it. Um, the fact is, is that it's actually a pretty cutting edge piece of tech. So um, it, the marketing describes it as the world's first truly intelligent, mobile, personal robot for your home. That's a lot of qualifiers. And um, as you can see here, it's actually a pretty small device. It's uh, about four feet tall and it's got kind of like an Android brain. Um, uh, that's like an Android tablet at the top with like a camera and a microphone and like a fully functioning touchscreen. Now, this device was created by uh, Robotemi Global LTD, and they're sort of like a startup company. This is their first uh, venture into like, the consumer space. But they actually spun off of a parent company called Roboteam, which is uh, did military robotics based out of Israel. Now, this thing isn't cheap. It's going to set you back about two grand, but you do get a lot of hardware for that price point. So you get it has the ability to do remote teleconferencing thanks to its camera and microphone. But uh, more importantly, it also has autonomous movement and obstacle detection, thanks to the various sensors it features and also the 360 LiDAR. And finally, as you'd expect, it has a Alexa and smart device integration, being a smart IoT device. And you get all the standard things you'd expect from an Android tablet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. It even has a wireless charging pad on the back that doubles as a coaster, at least for us. So, although uh, Robo uh, Robotemi likes to advertise their robot as being, you know, sort of a consumer device. Um, the reality is that it's actually seen a lot of use outside of that space. So uh, I think one of the biggest things we've seen recently is that it's used sort of as a mobile kiosk. So in places like the Mall of America and uh, the Nautilus Hotel, and even uh, in certain corporate environments like uh, Transfighter corporate office offices, uh, you'll see that it serves as an informational kiosk that has the advantage of being able to show people around. So instead of just telling people where to find, you know, like Jimmy John's in the mall, for example, it can actually navigate them there. But perhaps the most important and uh, impactful application of this robot is in healthcare, especially given the recent pandemic. So uh, with doctor's visits becoming more and more, uh, you know, the standards becoming more remote visits and remote, uh, you know, teleconferencing for uh, doctor's appointments, this has actually seen a lot of pickup in the healthcare space. So already we're seeing it being used by places like Trillium Health Resources, uh, in fact, it's also been picked up by uh, the Israel's Ministry of Defense as like the de facto uh, uh, teleconferencing solution for uh, the medical wards uh, throughout Israel. And we also see a lot of applications in uh, Southeast Asia of all places with places like China and South Korea, you know, ordering hundreds of these units for um, their nursing homes and medical institutions. And to accommodate this increased demand, uh, Robotemi has actually increased production of these units to about 1,000 a month, I believe, uh, to just to meet this uh, growing demand in the medical space. So now that we know what Temi is, what's it, what it's capable of, and where it's being used, it's important for us to sort of draw a, ba a box about what the normal operations of it look like. So then we had, can have a lot of fun breaking that box. So to start off, um, normal operation of the Temi is, is done through a use of its uh, smartphone app. And this is both on Android and iOS. So you can call the Temi from it. You remotely control it that way, that sort of thing. 
And the registration process for using this app is basically you just put in your phone number and it verifies it. And that's how it identifies you. So if you reinstall the app and use the same phone number, it'll still find up your, uh, your account details. Now, upon first booting up the robot, which already was a super fun experience unboxing this thing, but we are prompted to scan a QR code. And this basically just turns whatever user scans that QR code into the de facto admin of that Temi robot. And this, uh, the admin is only one per Temi, and they have the sort of the highest privileges for that robot. Now, it doesn't mean that other people can't call your robot or even use it. Um, phone contacts that uh, they use the Temi app, so phone contacts in like your smartphone, um, if they have the Temi app installed, they're synced automatically. And this can be done one of two ways. If the admin has phone contacts that have the Temi app, they'll be synced automatically to the robot, and the robot will be aware of them. Alternatively, if you're just a regular user of the phone app, you don't own a Temi, but you have a friend that does, for example, and they're in your phone contacts list, you'll be able to call your friend's uh, Temi robot from uh, the app. And we can sort of show you how that works. So once you boot up the app, uh, if it finds a contact that owns a Temi, they'll show up down here uh, on the left under your uh, contacts list. So here we have lab phone as uh, one of the contacts that owns a Temi. And by selecting this contact, you can see the Temi robot associated with it and even has a button that lets you just call it straight from the screen. And then once a call is actually initiated, this is sort of the interface you're presented with. You know, you can drive the robot around, um, you know, control your audio options, pretty standard stuff. Now calling is very much so the, the, the primo uh, functionality of this robot. And really callers get a lot of control over the device during the call. They get audio and video feeds from the Temi, but they also have control of its movement, which they can uh, control manually using the little D-pad you saw, but also has access to all of its saved locations. So this immediately became a very interesting point, uh, potential attack vector to us. Now, the Temi does ring when someone besides its admin calls it. So in that sense, you know, if you just added someone's phone number that they don't, they don't know you, you know, uh, it turns into basically just trying to cold call a cell phone. There is one exception to this, and that admins can actually grant certain users in their contacts list special privileges to bypass this limitation. So if you have like a family that all uses the same robot and you can't be bothered with having to pick up on the other end each time, um, an admin can grant several other users the ability to call in without having it ring. And this is also done through the phone app. You can just invite new members and then select whatever contacts you want to be able to control the robot, uh, whatever they want. So now that we have a good grasp of what the normal operation of this device looks like, we can sort of get uh, into the, the spirit of it, trying to hack this thing now. Now, although this tech is pretty novel and uh, cutting edge in a lot of ways, the approach we took to reconnaissance was fairly standard and typical. So we started with uh, trying to get a local shell on the device. This was actually super easy and short-circuited by the fact that um, the device comes with developer options, which include ADB or Anduk Android Debug Bridge, which uh, allows you to remotely connect to it like you would a, an SSH session. So that already made our lives a lot easier for moving files around and uh, accessing the device at startup. Uh, the next thing we tried to do is actually capture traffic on the device using uh, net, uh, using Wireshark. And uh, during like stuff like boot up and during phone calls, we saw three IPs being hit pretty frequently. One of these mapped to a Yahoo URL. So this is probably being used for its news app. And then two more mapped to Amazon AWS instances, which while not surprising, don't really reveal much either. The next thing we did was used our ADB shell to actually run, uh, N or sorry, not AD, this, that's a little later. We uh, ran an Nmap scan, port scan on the device to see what uh, ports it was listening on. Another standard thing you'd do for attack vectors. And the only port it identified as being open was the port 4443 which uh, Nmap classified as being used for the service Pharos, which is actually a, related to printing. So this is probably a false classification. Um, it's more likely that this port is being used as an alternative to the standard 443 you'd see used for HTTPS. Now, um, to verify that, we actually used the, the, the ADB shell we had to the device to run uh, Netstat and actually found that the service associated with this port is something called Com Robo Team Team USA which looks a lot more like uh, an Android uh, application than it does uh, you know, a standard Linux binary. And sure enough, that was the case. By parsing the list of pa installed packages on the device, we actually found the APK associated with this Android application. 
And using our ADB shell, it was trivial to pull this, uh, to pull this uh, APK off and start examining the software. So now that we had access to the software, um, and we also had access to the phone app software at this stage as well, because we could just download the APK from the Play Store. It's completely free, and you don't even need to own a Temi to run it. So we could um, uh, you know, start looking at both of those at the same time. Now, the rest of this is really going to be like 80% reversing and static analysis. That's just sort of the nature of this project. Now, why might you ask? You might ask why. Well, a great man once said, the road to exploitation is paved with months of staring at decompiled Java code. That man's name, Albert Einstein. So who am I to argue with that? Now, once we actually got to decompiling the code, um, we decided to use a program called JADX. And JADX was a, sort of a favorite of ours because it has a functionality of being able to right-click on any symbol and uh, click on it to find usage, which became really important later on. Uh, for, from there, we had to pick a vector. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually looked at reversing a full Android app, but they have massive code bases frequently, and Temi was no exception. Instead of groping in the dark, we decided that we needed to sort of hone in on a specific subset of the code to refine our search. In our case, we were already interested in the calling functionality of the robot, since that would grant us the greatest level of control entirely remotely. So we began digging through the different uh, libraries that are part of the, uh, the APK. After Googling around a bit, the one that jumped out at us uh, particularly was something called the Lib Agora. And this is actually a binary related to the Agora Video SDK, which is a third-party library used specifically for video calling functionality. Okay, that's perfect. That's exactly what we're interested in. So from there, we needed to find an entry point related to the attack vector. And you can sort of imagine this as being like a strand on like a wool sweater, the thing you start pulling on to really unwind, uh, unravel the whole thing. So we began by actually uh, pulling up this library in IDA and looking at its exports. And immediately the function native join channel jumped out at us. It looked like something related to joining a chat room, for example. Um, opening up the, uh, the APK now, we saw the same function with the same signature appear in the decompiled app. So that was a good sign. So from there, we could use JADX's uh, find usage feature like about 600 times to sort of begin tracing the, the code path taken to for uh, starting video calls. Now at this stage, there really is no more advice or uh, cool shortcuts. It really is, you just have to draw the rest of the owl. You really have to just put in the legwork to trace um, the different function calls that are being made in order to get a better understanding of how the code works. But the fruits of the, our labor in this case was actually pretty impressive. It's sort of like staring at the sun, so I'll only show it briefly. Did you catch that? All right, let's take a closer look at it. So uh, highlighted in the different colors near the top are the different entry points uh, for the calling code. So there's four ways to initiate a call from the phone app, and that correlates to these four. You can uh, call a, a phone contact, you can call a robot contact, you can call either contact from the recent calls list, and if you happen to be a Temi admin, you can also call your specific robot. Uh, moreover, we decided to segregate these based on the code flow that's uh, either for outgoing calls, indicated in red, or incoming calls, indicated in blue. And I'm not going to go through this too deeply because it's sort of massive, but this did serve as a good reference point for us, a lot of the reversing we had to do later. Okay, so we have four vulnerabilities to get through, so let's just jump right into it. The very first one, both chronologically and in terms of complexity, is uh, the CVE ending 7.0. And we can see here that it's uh, categorized as being a use of hard-coded credentials. And it's present in the Temi Android app. Now, to have a better understanding of what this vulnerability entails, let's go through the process we use to actually discover it. So this really consisted of four easy steps. R, T, F, and M. And I do mean that pretty literally, like just by looking through the Agora documentation for uh, their video calling API, we were able to get 80% of the way to finding this vulnerability. So uh, specifically, we decided to take a, a, a second look at that join channel function we saw earlier. 
According to the Agora documentation, it has two required parameters and uh, two optional ones. And this is really all that's needed to join a, an existing video call. Now, the, the first one is something called a token. And it seems that a token, if the user uses a static app ID, the token is also optional and can be set as null. This was interesting to us. And the second uh, required parameter for joining a channel is uh, a channel name. This is something you'll touch on a bit later. But for now, we were interested in the static app ID and whether the Temi was using a token at all. Taking a look at the same function in the code, we found that it is indeed setting that token parameter to null, which means that it's likely using a static app ID as indicated in the documentation. Okay, so then we decided to start looking for this, uh, this static app ID. Where could it be found? Referring back to the Agora documentation, we found the one function or the one API call that actually uses it as a parameter, and that's the rtcengine.create function. And it uses it as a parameter, and it describes it as being an app ID issued by Agora to the developers, which is sort of vague. But after some more digging, we sort of discovered that this is used as a sort of namespace that segregates different users or different implementations uh, on the, the Agora remote servers. So what it means is that you have a, a set uh, static app ID that's shared amongst all Temi robots and Temi phone app users. And the app ID ensures that uh, users of that service can only call other Temi uh, users. They can't call other an arbitrary you know, Agora client. So this is actually a pretty important credential to have access to. Well, uh, since we knew the function that takes it as an argument, we decided to look for this function in the Temi's decompiled code. And sure enough, there was the app ID hard-coded directly into the app that's freely accessible. Um, at the Play Store, and fairly trivial to decompile. So this was already a good start, but really to exploit this as a vulnerability, we needed not only um, the app ID, but also the channel name, so we could actually join an existing call potentially. So if we still needed the channel name, how could we get it? Well, by going through that uh, nice little graph I showed earlier, we were able to trace down what function actually generates the channel name. And here it's being called a session ID, but they're really the same thing. And as you can see, this is doing something not too complicated. It's actually just uh, generating a random six digit value. Now this is important because you know, 900,000 possibilities may seem like a lot, but it's well within the range of brute forcible attack vectors. So uh, in theory, an attacker could use the hard coded app ID they extracted from downloading the app, which is shared amongst all Temi installs. And then they could just use a brute force method to try and guess every single uh, possible channel name. And by doing so, they could potentially intercept every ongoing uh, Temi call used by any Temi install. Now, obviously we couldn't test such a brute force attack vector against a live production server, but what we could do is we, cr we could create a custom Agora app to join a Temi call just launched locally. And we did this by logging the channel name uh, using ADB. And sure enough, using this custom app, we were able to, uh, to join the existing call and essentially spy on the other two uh, call uh, members. So th thereby proving this is a legitimate attack vector. So the next vulnerability I'm going to discuss is sort of a helper vulnerability. It is classified as an origin validation error. And it is also present in the Temi Android app. Now, the reason why we call this a, sorry, the reason why we call this um, a helper vulnerability is that it actually is related to the fact that you can modify the Temi app um, and it still has full access to all the remote services it uses. It doesn't perform any kind of tamper checking to make sure that it's not running on a rooted device, that the, the code for the app hasn't been modified in any way. It just does, isn't aware of that. And the reason we were motivated to even pursue this as an attack vector is that it's much easier to modify an existing code than to start from scratch. But more importantly, the Temi Android app already has access to all those remote services, which requires some degree of authentication. Instead of trying to extract the keys it's using and whatever other authentication mechanisms from the app and trying to make it our own, we just leverage the existing app and inject our malicious code into it. So the way we'd accomplish this is by first unpacking the APK. 
which we can do using APK tool. Next, we would search for the particular uh, piece of code that we want to modify. This could be either through the decompiled code or through the various resource files included with the APK. As a proof of concept, we decided to try and change the text for the call button, which we found through some grepping. Okay. So now that we knew where, which part of the APK we wanted to change, the next thing was to simply make that modification. And that was as simple as pulling it up in a, a text editor and replacing the string with what we wanted. In this case, we decided to rename it Pwn, give it a little more spice. And the last but not least, we had to repack, but also re-sign the app. And the reason why we need to re-sign it is Android allows, uh, does not allow apps that are not signed to be installed onto the device. And by modifying the existing app's contents, we invalidated the existing signature. But no worries, since the signature is not being checked by the device, there's no reason why we can't just create our own signature and use that. So the repacking process is once again done using APK tool. And then we create a signature using a combination of key tool and jar signer, as shown here. And the end result was that we were able to successfully change the, the string on this call button. But perhaps more importantly, modifying the app in this way proved not to impact this functionality in the, in the least, meaning that we could potentially make non-trivial changes and still be able to perform things like calling. Now, exploitation of this vulnerability is a little tricky without spoiling uh, the rest of the presentation, because really its main application is used to help exploit the next two vulnerabilities. So we'll save that discussion for then. No spoilers. Okay. Vulnerability numero trace. So this one is actually missing authentication for a critical function, a little more serious than the last two. And this is actually present in Temi's MQTT broker, which if you don't know what MQTT is, I'm gonna give you guys a real quick crash course on it, just so we're all on the same page. So. MQTT is a published subscribe messaging protocol that's specifically designed for IoT and other lightweight devices. So it's not too surprising to see Temi using it. Now, the way it works is that clients will publish messages to certain topics, and then subscribers to those topics then receive the messages. You can think of it as sort of being like a, subscribing to a YouTube channel and then receiving notifications whenever your favorite YouTubers upload, for example. And then the topics themselves are strings that are organized into a hierarchy. And the hierarchy itself is delineated much in the same way that a Unix file system is. So just forward slashes. Now, the, in terms of the Temi, it uses MQTT for basically all communication between itself, the phone app, and the various cloud services. So you see it being used for things like video call invitations, syncing contacts from the admin, and even most importantly, privilege management, which is something we'll delve into in the next vulnerability. So um, let's get into the discovery and exploitation of this vulnerability. How are we using MQTT and what uh, authentication is not being implemented? Well, we we started by looking at the code that was used by the app to subscribe to its call invite topic. After all, we are interested first and foremost in the calling functionality. This is just a topic that uh, either a phone app or a robot will listen on um, when it receives phone calls. And then the person creating a call for that user will publish a message to that same topic. So in our case, it takes the form, uh, you can see it being invoked uh, here on line 408. That's the actual uh, function that is used to subscribe to that topic. And the topic string itself takes the form client uh, something followed by invite. And that's something in the middle is a client ID or an MQTT client ID rather. And an MQT client ID is just a unique identifier for a specific client that's connected to the same MQT broker. It's just a way, it's a way to identify different users. So this actually gave us an idea. If, uh, if, could we subscribe to someone else's call invite topic if we're able to modify the app? Well, in order to do that, we would need to know their client ID. So we would need to somehow get this information. Well, how are these client IDs even assigned? Well, looking back at our re how recent calls are initiated actually gave us a clue. So um, if you try to initiate a, a call from the recent calls list, this is the call code that gets uh, executed. It invokes a function called call, And the first parameter is actually an identifier for the, per for the uh, contact you're trying to initiate a call with. 
In this case, it gets that ID by invoking a function called getMD5 phone number. At this point, we were thinking, is it possible that the client ID is just an MD5 hash of the phone number um, the user used to register? We decided to verify this theory. So we did this simply by taking the phone, the Google Voice number we used uh, for our Temi admin, uh, computing the MD5 hash, and then searching for that exact hash in all the various Temi files we had. And sure enough, we got a hit in one of the logs we recorded during a call. And it classifies it right there as client ID. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Now, we modified, at this stage, we decided to modify the app, taking advantage of the previous vulnerability we outlined. And using this uh, technique, we were able to successfully subscribe to another user's call invite topic instead of our own, which basically meant that every single time they received the call, we would get that same call. And the only thing we needed to make this happen is the victim's phone number, which telemarketers will constantly remind us is not a high bar. Okay, so getting to the last and easily the most impactful vulnerability. Uh, this one is an authentication bypass using an alternate path or channel. And this is present in the Temi's REST API, which is something we'll cover as well. Now, in order to understand the authentication bypass, we first need to understand the authentication. And this is related to the Temi's privilege management system, which is something we've already sort of touched on with the admin versus regular contacts thing. So we already know about admins. That's just the person that first registers with the QR code. But there's also two other types of uh, privilege levels. Another one is contacts, which are just the default permissions given to uh, a user. It's also the lowest level. Now, um, there are two ways to become a contact. The first is simply by cold calling the Temi. And the other is through uh, the Temi admin syncing uh, contacts to the robot. We'll be focusing on this latter use case. So the Temi robot actually listens on the topic sync contacts and then followed by its uh, MQTT client ID or its robot ID, they're the same thing, for requests from the admin to sync contacts, as we can see here. Now, the requests themselves have the following structure. They're called, it uses an object of type sync contacts message. And all this contains is a list of contacts and the client ID of the person sending the request. And then the contact list is just a, you know, a tuples of a, a MQTT client IDs and the, the display names. Pretty straightforward. And the reason why the sender client ID is included is because the Temi uh, locally ensures that the sender is equivalent to um, the ID of its admin, just as a sanity check. Okay, so that's contacts. The third privilege level that's possible is something called an owner. And owners are actually related to that uh, functionality I showed earlier, where you can uh, add certain users as an admin and let them call into the Temi uh, remotely uh, without having it ring. So uh, a Temi admin uh, can, sends request. Now, sorry, let me back up a bit here. Th this is actually a little bit different from uh, adding contacts because while uh, adding a contact is pretty straightforward, um, adding owners is a little more complex because the request sent by the admin from the phone app is actually quite a bit different than what the Temi expects on the receiving end. So the admin sends its request to a REST API at the following URL, as we can see here. And the requests themselves have the following structure. Um, they contain uh, an inner request and also a signature that's uh, basically generated using the client's uh, private key. It's a way to identify who uh, the origin is. And then the, the inner request consists the list of the users, the list of users that we want to promote to owners, uh, the ID of the robot that we're sending the request for, uh, the source of the request, a timestamp, and then finally a type which um, is simply adding an owner or removing. Now, how is this different from what the Temi expects to receive on the other end? Well, it's quite a bit different. First of all, the Temi is listening on an entirely different channel. While the admin is sending its request to a REST API, the, the Temi robot is listening on an MQTT topic. 
this one specifically. But, um, and also the structure of the requests has also changed. It seems to be a subset of the request that the admin is sending, where it still has the list of owner IDs and the type, but it has been stripped of its signature, its timestamp, and its source. Now, at this point, we speculated that the reason for this is because the REST API itself is being used as an authentication mechanism um, for uh, adding owners. So this is sort of a sensitive privilege escalation type of deal. And so what the, the REST API would do is it verifies the, the request by checking the signature, and then it strips out all that verified information before sending it off to the Temi's MQTT topic, essentially serving as like a middleman. So th that means that our flowchart sort of looks like this. And presumably, if the, if the verification server deems the signature invalid, nothing happens. OK, so these uh, privilege levels mostly have utility in how calling works. So when a Temu receives a call from a user, if that uh, caller is either an admin or an owner, the Temu will pick up the call automatically. On the other hand, if the caller is a contact, it'll ring. So unfortunately, as an attacker, if we just tried to cold call the Temi, we would become a contact and the Temi would ring. What do we want? Well, we want to be able to call the Temi and have it pick up automatically. This is because uh, calling is sort of like the end game. You know, you get full control of the, the Temi's movement and also audio and video feeds to it. So what do we already know and what do we already have that can help us get there? Well, we do know that the Temi uses MQTT for calling and privilege management. And we know that it can, we can subscribe to arbitrary topics like we showed when we subscribed to someone else's call invite topic. So our next question was, can we also publish to arbitrary topics? Because if we could, we may be able to escalate our privilege by publishing the owner's message that the Temi expects to get from the authentication server directly and just publish it right to that uh, MQTT topic it's listening on, thereby bypassing that authentication middleman entirely. Well, this all sounds well and good, but there was a slight uh, caveat here. And that was, the Temi will only process privilege escalation requests for existing contacts. Now, why is this a problem? Well, there's only two ways to become a contact, one of which is to cold call the Temi, which is far from ideal, because that might arouse suspicion for various reasons if you have some stranger calling your robot. And then the other way is to have an admin send a sync's contacts message with you on it. Those are really the only two ways. Well, the solution is actually try is that's the latter. What we can do is we can actually spoof the admin sync contacts message by simply setting the sender client ID to the admin's client ID, since the Temi just implicitly trusts that this value is accurate. In this way, we can send a sync contacts message first followed by an add owner's message, and then finally initiate the call of the robot. So uh, this is sort of what the, the same functionality looks like after we've modified the app in the following ways. We can see already that it's a lot simpler. Um, and in order to become a contact, we just send a malformed request. In order to escalate to becoming an owner, we just send another malformed MQTT request. And then finally, unlike before, now that we have owner privileges, the Temi will uh, pick up the call automatically. Now, just as a quick recap of what uh, these vulnerabilities can do together. It's sort of a recipe for disaster. And the recipe includes these following steps. First, you find a vulnerability in the Temi. And then you just find three more. And here's a completely unrelated graphic of a bucket with holes. I just like buckets. Now the ingredients for this recipe involved just the user's phone number and honestly not much else. And what this produces is the ability to spy on calls, the ability to intercept calls intended for other users, and most importantly, the ability to remotely control the robot and see through its eyes and hear through its ears. Now, I've been teasing you guys enough. So at this point, I think it's a good time to show you guys a, a demo of how this all works.
So, uh, Shane or um, Sam, if you guys could uh, queue up the video. Hopefully. Demo is playing. Okay. So on the left, we have the Temi admin. And on the right, we have the attacker's phone. And we can see that I've already added the admin as a phone contact, thereby syncing it to the Temi's contact list. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to install the Temi app um, normally, unmodified, just straight from the Play Store, just to show that there's no smoke and mirrors involved. We'll later be using the modified app with the exact same credentials and going through the same registration process to show you that it really is the vulnerabilities that gives us the greater privileges. So, once we're done registering it, we're just going to attempt to cold call the Temi. And you can see the Temi screen in the bottom center there. Now, as expected, the Temi rings. It does not pick up automatically. This is because we only have contact privileges at this stage. The admin hasn't granted us any special rights. Okay, now that we know what the normal operation looks like, let's go ahead and install our custom modified app that leverages these vulnerabilities. And right off the bat, you'll see this actually looks very similar to the original app. We only modified what we needed to do. It's not until we initiate a call that we'll see how different it is. So as I stated previously, we'll be using the exact same credentials to register. And in theory, we should have the same privileges. All right, now the registration's done, we'll try initiating the call again. Except this time, it says pwn instead of call, so you know it's going to work. This time, the Temi picks up the call automatically, and the attacker now has full access to the Temi's movement, its camera, and its microphone. Now the first thing an attacker might do is actually mute the microphone, their microphone, I mean, and uh, turn off their camera, thereby essentially remaining anonymous as they do this. And you can start driving around whatever location it's in, start uh, looking around at whiteboards and other sensitive information. And you can also, you know, modify its volume to annoy people. But more importantly, you can actually navigate to its various saved locations. So here we're going to navigate to its back to its home base, just so it doesn't run out of battery. So that attack vector leveraged that last vulnerability it described, which gives us owner privileges. Let's look at how we can uh, exploit the, um, the previous vulnerability, which had to do with intercepting calls. So first we'll begin by starting a call from the Temi uh, for its admin. And as normal, you know, all's well with the world, um, the, the admin gets the call, but the attacker doesn't. This is expected behavior. But, from the hacked app, with a simple button press, we can change this entirely. By subscribing to the admin's uh, call invite topic, now when the Temi calls it again, both the attacker and the admin will receive the call. And the attacker is free to pick up this call and gain the same uh, control over the robot it did with the other attack vector. That concludes the demo. Got a couple slides to finish off. So let's talk about the vendor's response to our research. So we disclosed all four vulnerabilities to Robotemi Global LTD on March 5th. They responded very quickly and they were very receptive to all the suggested mitigations for these vulnerabilities that we outlined in our report. But perhaps most importantly, they maintain constant communication throughout the process, uh, working with us to uh, mitigate the vulnerabilities. Um, speaking of which, all four CVEs are actually patched as of July 15th. And McAfee ATR, uh, my team, 
has reviewed the patches and has confirmed that they, they successfully mitigate all four CDEs. Now, all code shown as a result is from the older vulnerable versions of the, uh, the APKs. In fact, the code is now heavily obfuscated and much harder to parse. And this is sort of the gold standard we seek out in uh, security researcher and vendor relationships, where it's a mutually beneficial um, thing where um, the vendor responds quickly and we're able to get these things patched as soon as possible, ultimately resulting in a safer product for everyone. Now, before I let you guys go, I do want to discuss re really briefly the various impact scenarios uh, you might see these used for these vulnerabilities. I think the biggest one is healthcare. Um, th there's obvious privacy concerns whenever you, you know, spy on a potential medical appointment or anything to do with um, health information. That's why HIPAA is such a big deal. But uh, another potential attack vector might be um, you know, using it as a sort of espionage for getting the status or location of persons of interest within a hospital. That might be something a nation state uh, actor might be interested in. Another attack uh, scenario I want to have you guys think about is the enterprise one. So we've already seen that these robots are being used in corporate offices. Now, you know, this actually would grant an attacker access to certain information that simply isn't accessible from a network-based attack scenario. Things like you know information posted on bulletin boards, on post-its, um, on computers. I hope it wouldn't be a password, but who knows? Uh, network diagrams on whiteboards and other sensitive information, and perhaps more obviously, the ability to spy on boardroom meetings. What kind of uh, sensitive information or trade secrets could uh, could be listened through? And it's not too surprising to see a teleconference robot being used in a room for teleconferencing. And with that said. That concludes my talk. I will be uh, present in the Discord server to answer any questions you guys have. And uh, thanks for uh, tuning in.